Okay, so this was the last slide from um, our last week class. And we ended by talking about how can we combine the fixed effects, uh, the cross-sectional fixed effects and the time fixed effects into one regression model. And the one that you see here is just one of many types. So the one that you see here is the one that has um, N, so let me just choose a different color. So here we are using N minus one cross-sectional fixed effects and T, uh, small t, T minus one time effects, right? And then, uh, and we have intercept. So this is just one way of doing it, but we can also drop the intercept from here and have the N cross-sectional dummies and the T uh, time dummies, okay? We can also, like this is another option, um, and this would be done if I have large number of uh, cross sections. So it would be like, so I can say or, like this is different way of adding time and cross sectional fixed effects by saying, okay, it's y i t is equal to alpha zero plus let's say uh, alpha one x i t plus alpha two, I'm going to call the cross section as f i plus alpha three s t plus u i t. And this one captures the cross section fixed effect, just one column, and then this one is capturing the time fixed effect and then again it's one column and this column would be taking one for cross section one two for, for cross section two and then keep going and then it's going to be taking let's say number n for cross section n and this one again would be like taking one for time one taking two for time two and then taking capital t for time capital T, okay, which is the very last one, okay? So we have just one column that takes, uh, that, that is basically capturing the cross-section fixed effects, and then another column for capturing the time fixed effects. And this is basically used when I have, or this is recommended when I have large um, cross-sections, right? And or large time periods, okay? So if I'm doing like a research or if I'm doing the project and I have, let's say 15 countries, I'm not going to add 15 dummies or 15 minus one dummies. And if I'm working on 20 countries, I'm not going, I mean 20 years, I'm not going to add either 20 time periods or 19, which is T minus one, right? So it's an, it's an option that is commonly used when I have large number of dummies. I'm not going to use uh, this one, if I have large number of cross sections or large number of time periods, okay? So this one, you will usually see it in uh, research papers that have a large number of cross sections or long period of, uh, long period of time, okay? Um, so this is basically ends the different types of panel models. Um, what I want to discuss next is the assumptions, and this is very important. And the assumptions, or the panel model assumptions, or we call it the least square assumptions for panel models or panel data are basically, we have four important assumptions, okay? And we're gonna spend time in discussing each and every uh, assumption. So if I have a model, like a, a very simple model, if I have a model like yit is equal to, um, let's, let me just make it a very simple one, okay? Beta zero plus beta one xit plus, um, beta to uh, f 
i plus beta 3 st plus u i t. And the first assumption, and then of course this one for the time that starts from the very first, I mean for the cross section that starts from the very first one until cross section number n, and this one where small t starts from the very first time period all the way up to the very last one, capital T. Okay, there are four important assumptions. We're going to spend time talking about two of them. Okay, so the first one, the first one is basically saying that, and this is something like not new for you, we have discussed something similar to that, the expectation of the error term over cross section over time conditioned on the set of x's and this set of x's for each cross section. So I'm not going to move over the i's because I'm considering this for one specific country, for example. Okay, and for year one, for the same country, year two, and then keep going for the same country, but the very last year. Okay, comma, v, f, i, comma, the s t okay let me just make some space here i'm going to erase this okay. so you know already that this is over the whole period of time and the whole set of uh, cross sections and you close that and it's equal to zero so as you can imagine this is kind of an extension to our um, assumption that we used to have in cross-sectional analysis, just remember or recall, we used to have it like this, expectation of ui given xi is equal to zero. This is what we used to have in cross-sectional analysis. So this is just for you to remember, okay? Uh, but now for panel, I have to extend this i into different years. And I have also to include different types of uh, fixed effects, whether this is the cross-sectional or the time effect. And what does this assumption is telling us? This assumption is telling us that the error term UIT has a mean of zero, right? And this mean is equal to zero or the conditional expectation, right? Because this is the conditional expectation of UI or the error term is equal to zero given or conditioned on the history of the axes I have in the model, right? And the cross-section fixed effect and the time fixed effects. There is no connection between the error term now and the history of all the axis, right? So let me give you an example. If I'm saying that the expectation of the error term of Argentina in the 1990, so this is a comma, right? This is a comma. In the 1990, right? Conditioned on X of Argentina, because it's the same country, in 1990, right? And let me make it like 1980, so it's the whole set, okay? And then uh, X in Argentina in 1981. And then I keep going for all the history of the X in Argentina until the very last one, assuming that my last time period is 1990, okay? Is equal to zero. So this one is telling me that the error term in the 1990 is not correlated with any history of the X in the past, right? Whether there is any connection between um, 1990 error term and 1980 value of X, it's zero. 1981, still zero. 1990 is still zero. Okay, so this one is telling me that there is no omitted lagged, so lag is the past, right? Lagged effects 
okay? So any lagged effect of X, any lagged effect of X, if I do have, if let's say uh, today is 19, for example, 80, and whether 1979 affects my Y, it has to be included in my regression. But if it is not included, then I assume that there is no omitted lagged effect, okay? This is a simple connection between our um, panel model and our topic of omitted variable uh, bias of, of whether I do have any econometric uh, issue related to econometric, uh, related to omitted variable bias. Here I'm saying it's no, there is no connection between the past history of X and today's error term. You can also extend this, and I'm going to extend this by, let me erase this so, so we are on the same slide instead of going to a next slide. I just want to show you everything on one slide. So let me um, also extend this by saying also this assumption means that the error term in Argentina given 1980 conditioned, I'm going to repeat all the X as you see it here. So X in Argentina in 1980, uh, X in Argentina in 1981, and then keep going. I'm just repeating exactly, copy paste. Argentina, 1990. Again, is equal to zero. So this is another way of saying it, okay? So, sorry. Okay. So this is another way of saying it, okay? Um, by saying that also, there is no feedback, right? Because now this is 1980 and this is the future. So this assumption is also saying that there is no feedback effect, okay? Whatever future values um, of X, they are not connected with the past value of the error term, okay? In other words, you can say there is no feedback from you to future access. So this assumption is extending what we already know about omitted variable bias, but because our data set now is expanded into time, we're just expanding also our definition of omitted variable bias by saying there is no future effects from the error term on the axis. There is no feedback effects from the axis on the error term. They are totally disconnected. Okay, so if I, uh, for example, come, uh, uh, apply this to the example that we were talking about, which is the fatality rate. Okay, so this one is telling me that, okay, remember we had here, uh, this was fatality rate which was our, our Y. And we had like some set of uh, variables and then one of, one of them was our X was the tax on the case of beer. And we wanted to see whether increasing taxes, and this is what we expect on a case of beer with reduced fatality rate. Okay? We wanted to see this negative impact. Okay, so this, uh, this assumption is telling us that whether a state has high fatality rate this year doesn't affect whether it's going to increase taxes in the following year. Okay, so again, I want you to think about the, er the error term as representing your fatality rate because the error term here is actually the difference between fatality rate, the actual observation minus the um, estimated fatality rate. So the error term is just a representation of fatality rate. So I'm gonna write it as FR, fatality rate minus fatality rate hat. This is what makes my error term, right? So this assumption is telling me that whatever the value of fatality rate now, it's not going to affect my future values of tax rate. Okay, it's a big assumption, right? Because usually what happens is 
if I have high fatality rate now, the policymakers are assumed to increase taxes in the future, right? So, so that they can deal with this high fatality rate. They can respond to this high fatality rate by increasing taxes. This big assumption is telling us, no, we don't have this connection. Okay, and as you always know, these assumptions sometimes doesn't make any sense. And we, what we did with our cross-sectional topic is we put these assumptions, we understand them, and then we drop these assumptions and see how it affects our model. So this assumption is telling us there is no connection between fatality rate or the representation of fatality rate. UI is a representation of fatality rate. Fatality rate minus fatality rate hat with either the lagged values of x or the future values of x, the past values of x and the future values of x, okay? So this is our first big assumption. And that's why I spend, I, I say big because it's related to so many econometric issues that we will see uh, if we drop this assumption, okay? Again, we will run into the problem of omitted variable bias problem, but the bias now is coming from whether I have future values of x connected with the error term or past values of x connected with the error term. Okay, as you can see here, I rewrote it twice, depending on which one uh, we're talking about. The second big assumption, number two, okay, is telling us that we know this already, okay? And I want you to recall this. I want you to recall that we said before that y1, y2, all the way to y, n, where i, i, d. You remember that already from the cross-sectional analysis. Now I want to expand this for the time, uh, I mean for the panel, okay? And also we used to say that my set of X's were the first person, second person, all the way to person number N where I ID. Whatever I choose the Y, it has its connected X, right? So if I'm talking about the salary of the first person, I'm talking about the gender of the first person. If this is I ID, this is I ID, okay? So this is just for you to recall. We're going to repeat the same idea, but for the panel setting. So in the panel setting, my assumption is again, one thing before I leave the first assumption, I want you to notice that here I was saying I, and then I gave you an example on Argentina. I'm sure that you understand that you can repeat this for, let's say Peru, for Brazil, for any other country. We're gonna repeat this assumption for each and every country. So you can repeat this I equal one all the way to N. So this assumption is repeated for all cross sections, not, does not only apply for the first cross section or does not only apply, let's say for, an, for Argentina, but it applies for each and every cross section I have in my data set. Next, again, sorry, I have to go to, oh, for six, where is 26, this one. Here. Okay, so number two, it's actually saying that X I one again. I'm talking about one country, okay, and then you repeat for other countries. X I two the second year. X I last year. Comma, the set of editor. U I year one, U, I, year two, and then keep going, U, I, year T, R, I, I, D, independent, right, so we, we said this before, independent, identical, distribution. Distributed or independently, identically distributed, IID. It's a big assumption, right? So it's, it's easy, let me just read. 
it's easy to have an IID assumption for cross-section. If I'm collecting a group of people and I'm trying to estimate the impact of the wage as a function of age, as a function of, uh, you know, this model, education, experience, and gender, and so on. Each and every person I collect from this sample, there is no reason that this person would give me any information about the next person, right? And if I pick person number 10, he or she will not give me any information about person number 11 or person number nine or person number one. So it's easy in cross-sectional analysis because this was a cross-section over I, over I. It's easy in cross-sectional analysis to make the assumption of independence okay each and every person is completely independent from or like, information of any of one person is completely independent from any other person and also it was easy to make the assumption of identical if i do have let's say a population or a group uh, of let's say 500 people and i just want to get a sample of let's say 50 people right which is a subset of the 500 each and every person here has the same probability of being included in the sample. So this is my sample and this is my population. So we assume that the 50 people, each and every person of the 50 people have the same probability of being chosen and that's what makes it identical. Okay, can I apply the same uh, assumption to panel data set? I want you to notice that the panel data set moves on time and cross sections, okay? So I want you to think about it this way. So if I do have, or my data set, start from person number one, person number two, person number N, but each and every person or each and every country goes over time. So T1, T2, T, capital T, okay? And the error term of this set is country one, year one. Country one, year two. Country one, last year. Country two, year one. Country two, year two. Keep going. Country two, year T. You can fill all these. And this one would be like at a term of country two, uh, sorry, um, year one. And then this one would be at a term of the cross section number N and T, right? So what I have here, sorry, there is a one mistake, just I'm going to correct it. Okay, so this is cross section number N, year one. Okay, and then cross section number N, and then we fill all these gaps. It's easy to imagine, like if I want to apply my cross sectional assumption to this new data set, it's easy to understand that if I move between cross sections, there is IID. So if I move this way horizontally, there is IID. Why? Because the person number one is completely independent from person number two, is completely independent from person number N or country number N. So if I move horizontally, I can understand that I can still have IID between cross sections, right? Each and every cross section is completely independent from the other one. If this is Argentina, this is Brazil, I don't know why I keep getting the example of Latin American countries, but this is how it goes. And this is Peru. It, if I move between the eyes, if I move between the countries, if I move between individuals, then I can make it IID. I can still um, understand that it's, uh, people are, or countries are chosen um, with identical distribution, like each and every country has the same probability of being chosen. And I can still uh, have the assumption that they are completely independent. OK, 
okay, if they are selected randomly. However, if I move this way, vertically, is there any reason to believe that the error term of Argentina in year one is completely disconnected with the error term of Argentina in year two is completely disconnected. There is, like, it doesn't make any sense, right? Because if this is interest rate, if this is interest rate of Argentina in year one, interest rate in Argentina in year two, interest rate in Argentina in year T, there is no reason to believe that they are completely disconnected because usually policymakers see what happened in the past to make, you know, or change policies for the current and the future, right? If I'm saying weather, is where the weather is completely disconnected between today and tomorrow. Usually the weather comes in clusters, right? So I have two, three days of snow. I have two, three days of rainy days, right? So it's connected. So if I'm talking about time, okay, then the IID assumption might not be true, right? So no IID. So the IID assumption might be violated, okay? So again, um, introducing time dimension to the data set would violate the assumption of IID. It wouldn't violate it if I'm moving horizontally through cross sections, but it is violated if I'm moving vertically through time. So how can we deal with this problem? Okay. Uh, if this one is correlated with this one and this one is correlated with this one and this one is correlated with this one, we call it serial correlation. Serial correlation is just a correlation, but when the variable is correlated with itself, we call it serial correlation and we usually um, uh, say serial correlation for the error term. So when the error term is correlated with itself over time, we say this is called serial correlation, which is simply a correlation that we know, but of the same variable with itself over time. Okay, so how can we deal with this problem? If I do have serial uh, correlation, because it doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't make any sense, or it would be unrealistic to assume that I do have IID here. It's unrealistic. It's realistic that I can assume it here. Okay, so in order to deal with this problem, in the panel model, we introduce a new standard error that deals with the serial correlation. Um, again, I want to remind you that in the, the uh, cross-sectional um, analysis, we introduced a standard error, which is called the heteroscedastic standard error that is used in order to override this assumption right, the, of being identical, because I would say, okay, no, they are not identical, no, the error term is, is not homogeneous, it's heteroscedastic. So the heteroscedastic standard error used to override the assumption uh, that the uh, uh, data is identical, right? Now I want to override this assumption being independent because now I can see that this cluster is dependent. I can see that this cluster is dependent and I also can see that this cluster is most likely dependent. So I actually need to test for serial correlation. So number one thing I need to do whenever I have panel model is I need to test to whether the, my data set are correlated through time per cross section, per each I, okay? Um, so this assumption, as you can see it here, it's moving through time, but not through cross-section, but I can still repeat or rewrite it for all cross-sections because it applies for all cross-sections. Let's say I'm writing this one for Argentina, just repeat it for Brazil, just repeat it for Peru, just repeat it for any other country, okay? But the idea is the same. Do I have serial correlation problem over time? If the answer is yes, then you cannot use the regular standard error. We used to override again this assumption by using the heteroscedastic standard error. We use the BP test. 
the brusque pageant test, we used to use it in order to test of being identical. Okay, now I need to find another test to check for independence. And if it turns out to be yes, um, they are independent, then I don't have any problem. But if it turned out to be, if it turns out to be no, they are dependent, each observation depend on the next or the previous one. Uh, so we cannot call it independent, we just have to call it dependent, then I have to use another um, then I have to use another different standard error. So just to summarize, for the IID assumption, and this is being independent, like you need to ask, the, are the observations independent? Are they identical? Okay, and this is between brackets. Are they homoscedastic? And this is between brackets. Are they serially correlated? Right, so this is a different way of asking the question. Homoscedastic, do the BT test for heteroscedastics. You know this already. And I'm going to show it to you in STATA if we have time today, or I'm going to uh, put it in the materials for the recitation. Okay. Are they serial, serially correlated? Do a serial correlation test. And I'm going to show it to you. Okay. And if it turns out to be that they are heteroscedastic, plus serially correlated, then I have a new standard error called the cluster standard error. Or to be like more specific, yes, it is called cluster standard error because it, it actually clusters observations together. So here it would cluster this observation together by saying I'm allowing like this cluster standard error would allow for correlation within cross-section and no correlation across cross-sections okay so it would allow for a correlation within a cross-section but not right across uh, cross-sections okay so to be more specific, I said here cluster standard error. And in STATA, you would actually type cluster, okay? So cluster, and I'm going to show it to you. Cluster would give you the option of allowing for uh, correlation within a cluster. I want you to think about a cluster is a grouping. I want you to think about the cluster is a group of observation, observations. Uh, for example, group of observations for Argentina, then another group for Brazil, and another group for Peru. Or if I have, let's say, all countries of the world, and I feel like the Latin American countries are do have something in common, so I can put them together in cluster. And if I feel like the Middle East and North African countries, they have something together, they do correlate together, and then I'm going to put them in another cluster. So the cluster can be done in groups of countries or groups of regions. Okay, and this is like details that we will discuss later. So I'm saying it's a cluster standard error, okay? The one, um, or the, the main terminology used is called the heteroscedastic and autocorrelation, autocorrelation consistent, so this is consistent, sorry, my terrible handwriting, consistent standard error, and actually it's abbreviated, this part is abbreviated as the hack estimator, 
Okay, so it's known for the hack estimator. What is the hack estimator? Is that standard error that allows for heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation? Okay, this one would override the assumption of being identical, and this one override the assumption of being independent. No, they are dependent. No, they are not identical. That's the idea. All right. And the second very similar to whatever we have discussed for heteroscedastic standard error, again, would apply for the hack estimator. So the standard errors Sorry, I just want, I'm trying to write so many things at the same time. Um, so in Stata, we actually have something, let's say like regress, y, x1, x2, okay, comma, cluster, and suppose that I want to cluster by countries, okay? So I'm going to type here, countries, assuming that this is the name that you have it in Stata for your cross-section, okay? So here, Stata would give you, the, in the output, you know that the output is the uh, coefficients, the standard error, the t-statistic, the p-value, confidence, and so on. Whatever you see for the standard error is going to be the hack estimator or the heteroscedastic and autocorrelation consistent standard error. So once you type cluster here, okay, then it would give you the hack estimator or the hack standard error. Uh, the good news is, and I told you this before, some people are lazy to perform any test. Okay, so they are lazy to perform a test. So I said that in order to be able to use this test, I have to, uh, to check whether I actually need it or not. So before you run into using it, you need to check whether you actually need it or not, okay? So suppose that I have uh, a data set, regress y, x1, and x2. You know this, so to check for heteroscedasticity, I would type het test and iid to override the assumption of being independent, identically distributed, and then you perform the BP test. Next, x t serial. So this is the command for the to check whether I do have serial correlation or not. And y x one x two. So you would type your model right after x t serial. So the x t serial would give you the again the statistic and the p value. And remember here, what is the Null hypothesis, the null hypothesis is no autocorrelation. Usually the null hypothesis is the good news. Okay, so this one is telling me no autocorrelation. And for example, and then of course the alternative is autocorrelation, okay? Of course I would like to, right? Um, what I hope to, I, I hope to get a high p-value so that I say, okay, I have no autocorrelation of, over time, so just no problem, right? Um, the data for, um, if I have a high p-value, then it's going to be telling me that there is a high probability of no autocorrelation over time, then you don't have any serial correlation problem. So if, and, and of course, if I get like a low p-value, then I'm going to say I have autocorrelation problem. So if I have a, a low p value for this one, which basically say uh, that the variance is not constant or I do have heteroscedasticity, and if I have a low p value for this test, again, I have autocorrelation, then in this situation, I would go ahead and change the standard error used by using cluster and the cluster here by whatever cross-section name I have, I'm going to assume I'm calling it countries or people or individuals or whatever, students, anything, okay? And this would automatically compute for you 
the standard error that combines both head risk elasticity and autocorrelation. If, for example, I have a p-value that is for this one, um, just assumption, okay? So suppose that I have only head risk elasticity and just assumption. Suppose I have only head risk elasticity, but no serial correlation. So what should I do? I don't have any serial correlation or I have a high key value for this null. So in this situation, you can just do whatever you have done before. So whatever we have done before, which is to just use a heteroscedastic standard error. And again, it's just R, right? R for robust, okay? So this one would be computing for you the robust standard error. And that's it, you don't, have, you don't need serial correlation. Okay, all right, so this is all under the uh, assumption number two. And what you do have in your slides, on your slides, you do have like the detailed computation of the cluster standard error and how this cluster standard error allowing for um, autocorrelation within a cross section. And I'm just going to briefly go over that. I'm not just the one to spend so much time just going over the details of the formula because you already have it in your slides. Uh, but just one thing I want to stress on. So when I do have, and again, like uh, I want you to imagine that in the data set or in the, in the panel data set, you're moving across time and across cross section. So if I do have a model like this, um, or let me just compute the, let me compute. Okay, so this is more details on the cluster standard error. Okay, so just, just a few more points on the cluster standard error and everything is under assumption number two. So if I want to compute the average, okay, so I do have a model Okay, y i t, just a simple model, beta naught plus beta one x i t, right? Plus beta two f i plus beta three s t plus u i t. And I know that this is moving cross sections over time. What is the average? I want now to compute the average of y bar. The average of y bar has two parts. It has a part that is moving through cross section and a part that is moving through time. So that means in order to be able to compute that, I have to account for these two parts, right? So I have to say, okay, it's the sum from i equal one to n, but it's also the sum from t equal one to capital T right, of yit over sure. n and t. So this is our new average because my new average now is just combining cross section and time together. Professor? So if I start with the t, okay? So if I start with the t, in other words, I'm just getting the summation over time. So if I start with the t, then it's going to be one over n the sum from i equal one to n of y bar i. So what I have done now is like I started with, the with one of them, okay? So I took the sum of i t divided by t and I'm left with, and I'm left with the n, its summation and the y. Okay, so that's why what, this is what you have here. If you have any question, just stop me, right? There is a question, Professor. Okay. And then what we do next is, so this one actually, like when you think, we, we can call this one as y bar i. What is y bar i? It's the sample mean for entity or cross-section I, okay? 
Next, I can also like think about the variance of this i. So the variance square of this y bar i, it's equal to the variance of y bar i. And I can write it or I can just open this back. Right? So I can write it this way. I can write it as the variance, just open it back, of 1 over t, the sum from t equals 1 to capital T of y i t. Okay? And you can actually take the t out of the variance operator and it's gonna be one over t squared. The variance of, you can open this y because I have it over different time periods. So it's gonna be like y i one plus y i two plus, and this is just for one cross section, right? I capital T, okay? You can actually take this variance for each and every observation separately. So you can do it like this. One over t squared of, this is t squared, over the variance of y i one plus the variance y i two plus the variance of y i t. So this is capital T. So the idea is you're just opening each and every observation, okay? And whenever I have the variance and I have multiple observations that might be serially correlated, then I have to account for the covariance also. So the two covariance between year one, year two, and just notice it's for the same country or the same cross section, two, the covariance of I1 first year, but possibly correlated with year three. And then you just think about all possible combinations of the different years you have. And generally it's gonna be like the very last one, T minus one and capital T, okay? So if this YI is serially correlated if it is serially correlated, I mean, if I do have a problem, then I do have a number for all these components, which is the correlation, the, the correlation between year today and year yesterday and year today and two years ago, two years uh, before, and then um, the very last year and the year before and all different years. So I would have to account for all that. So if the opposite, if it is, if y i t is serially uncorrelated, okay, then this basically means that all the covariances are gonna be equal to zero. So this one is gone, gone, gone. And then you go back to your usual computation of the standard error because I don't have any serial correlation. So if I perform the test and the test is telling me that you don't have any serial correlation problem, the, another way of thinking about it is actually the components of all the two, of the different covariances between the different years are not statistically significant, okay? So the YIT, if all of these are equal to zero or they are not different from zero, indifferent from zero, okay? Then you basically go into um, just compute the regular computation of your standard error. However, if, just let me repeat what, if serially correlated, okay, then if all these covariances are not equal to zero, okay, so they are not equal, they have a certain number, then the usual computation of standard error is wrong. 
So you have to change this computation by allowing for the covariances, okay? So this one, we would have to have this one to allow for these uh, possible serial correlation. And I want you to imagine that if all of these are positive, this is positive, 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 then the usual computation of the standard error would underestimate the correct standard error if I do have serial correlation, right? Because if these are positive, then the number that I get here would be higher than the standard error from the usual computation. The usual computation does not have actually any covariances. It's just the computation of the variance of the observation, assuming that I have independence between observations. Okay, so, uh, so this is the idea of the uh, cluster standard error. Let me compute the last two uh, assumptions. And then after that, if we have time, I'm going to um, tell you about the R square because we have different types of R square, as I mentioned, and the different types are, uh, would depend on the size of your uh, time dimension versus the cross-sectional dimension. Okay, so number three, Actually, I'm not going to spend time here, okay? Uh, no large outliers. If you do have large outliers, then just go back to your data set. Just try to study these outliers. Are these important? Are these needed? If not, just drop them from your um, uh, estimation. Number four, no, you know this already, no perfect multi collinearity. Okay, so we're not going to spend time on assumption three and four because you already know that. Okay, it's nothing different. Okay, and just remember, I want you to remember that to avoid dummy variable trap. Okay, because in panel model, if I have uh, n dummies, or if I have T dummies, remember, no intercept. Because if you in introduce an intercept with N dummies and T dummies, this would be wrong. So this would be, this would create a, an econometric problem. And it's called the dummy variable trap. So to avoid that, just have n minus one, t minus one, plus intercept, or n t intercept, uh, plus intercept, plus this one is no intercept. Okay, so the, why we're doing that? We want to avoid the perfect multicollinearity because we, uh, if we include the n, the t, the intercept, would create perfect multiple We, you will not be able to estimate them out. All right. So the next, uh, let me give you an example. It's, it's just a very simple example that would um, just makes it easy to. Imagine what's going on in panel data. So before we move to the different types of R square, I want you to see this example. So suppose that I have a data set that is like this. So I have, this is the country this is the year. This is, I'm just going to make any variable y. So GDP. Okay. And then uh, the first country, suppose I have only two years.
Peru, Peru, so I have only two years. And of course, you can extend, uh, you can extend this data set, but just I'm trying to make a simple example. Okay, and suppose that we are observing this model over 1990-1991. Okay, and this is GDP, so the GDP is what we have here is, let's say, I'm just going to make simple numbers, 100, 200, 300, or any numbers, okay? Just, I just want to, um, show you a simple example. So this GDP is moving, you know, is different across countries and across time. So it's IT. Okay. Uh, now, suppose that I want to compute the average. Okay. So the average would be, um, I have two different types of averages. Do I want to do the average over time per cross section or per per uh, a period of time over cross sections, okay? So let's see. So suppose I want to compute the GDP uh, bar I. What is the GDP bar I? The GDP bar I is actually equal to the sum from T equal one. So this is T. So this is T equal one. Okay, to capital T of GDPIT, which is the previous column, over time. So it's actually like, I'm asking you, can you compute for me an average for Argentina? Can you compute for me the average of GDP for Brazil, for Peru? So all what you need to do is this one plus this one over two. So it's going to be like 100 plus 200 over two. Right? So it's going to be like just one number. So if I'm asking you what is this value for Argentina, then it's going to be just easy, right? So it's going to be, um, okay, the average for this one is like 150, 150, 350, 350, 550, 550. And this is called the GDP bar I. And this one is GDP IT. So let's uh, have some notations. This is column one, column two, column three, column four. So column four is the average of GDP over time per cross section. This is actually the one I was computing here. So when I was telling you here, it's this one. Okay. So what we're doing is taking the average over cross section, this one, right? So what we're getting is GDP bar I. GDP bar I is I'm summing over time per cross section. So it moves over I. Why? Because it, it moves over I because I have a different value for each cross section. Next, what if I'm asking you, can you get me GDP bar? It doesn't move over time, it doesn't move over T. So what does that mean? I'm actually asking you to get me the average of the average of GDP I. I want just one average for all the countries in my data set. So this one would be, okay, so this one would be, I'm summing for I equal one to N of the previous column, Y bar I over N. In other words, what you're doing is you're getting 150 plus 350 plus 550 over three. Okay, so this one would be, okay, this is 350, 350, 350. Just repeat it. So why I'm giving you this example? Because I'm going to use it in order to show you how we have different R squares, okay? As you can see, this GDP doesn't have a sub I, doesn't have a sub T. It doesn't change over time for each cross section, doesn't change um, over cross sections. It's, it's just the same number. Okay, this one has a sub I because it changes between cross sections. It doesn't have a sub T because it's the same over time per cross section. 
So how can I use this information to compute the different um, R squares? So when you run uh, your regressions, you have three different types of R squares. So we have three types, three types of R square. And of course you can imagine that you have also three different types of adjusted R square, but it's just the, uh, the, uh, the difference between R square and the adjusted is the adjustment of degrees of freedom. So let's just talk about the R square first. So we have one which you already know, which is called the R square, but here I'm gonna just call it the overall R square. The overall R square is the explained sum squared over the total sum squared. And again, this equation or this formula doesn't change for the different types of R square. I have something called the within R square. Again, ESS, TSS. And I have something called the between R square. Again, ESS, TSS. Now, yes, I understand that, that ESS over TSS for each one that doesn't like differ between the three, but the components of the ESS and the TSS are different. I want you to think about overall as being the R square that is trying to measure the explanation of the model over time and over cross section. So it's taking everyone, everything, right? All the data that you have over time and over cross sections. However, if I do something, if I do have time dimension that is bigger than the cross sectional dimension, in other words, the number of time periods is much bigger than the number of cross section, then the within R square is actually important because within is, as the name suggests, within it's within a country, okay? What's going on within a country? And within a country, then I'm moving through time. So I want you to imagine that the within is about the within for Argentina, the within for Brazil, the within for Peru, within the country. So if I have time dimension that is higher than the cross-sectional dimension, then actually the within matters for me. Um, now, this one, as I guess you're expecting this, so between, if the number of n is higher than the number of time periods, then actually the between R squared matters to me. Between means between cross sections, how the explanation of the model changes between cross sections. I really don't care about, like in the between, I really don't care about what's going on within each cross section, but I really care about between cross sections, okay? The explanation of the model between cross sections. And as you might expect, this would be, what about the average here versus the average of time here versus the average of time here? Because the within R squared doesn't really care about the specifics of the time. It really cares about the average of time for each cross section. So let's uh, write the different uh, formulas here. So for this one, it's the sum from I equals one um, to n, okay, over y i hat minus the sum. I want you to imagine that this one is column number five, which is the sum from i hat i over n squared. I want you to imagine that this is actually column number five here okay which is the average for everyone so you can actually make your life easy and say okay let's write a nicer formula and call this one and i'm going to refer to column five i can call this one as y bar and this one is column five 
okay? Square over the sum from i equal one to n of y i minus <clears throat> y bar square, okay? So this is for the first one, okay? <clears throat> Uh, as you like, as you can imagine, like this is like just each observation, right? How far it is from the average of cross sections I have. Like here, I had 350. So the number for y bar would then be like 350 for everyone. Okay. And the next one would be uh, how far from i equal one to n of y hat i minus y bar i. So this one would be the deviations of, of, of each observation within each cross section. So this one would be the y bar computed in column four. So deviation out of each observation within each cross section. So this one would be like how far this one deviates from this, how far this one deviates from this, and so on. Okay. Um, actually, let me actually add something here. So this is I1, T equal one to capital T. And this one also, T equal one to capital T. And same here, because we have, we're moving, like we're taking this computing, we're computing this for each country over its two time periods as we have in the previous exam. So I do have to include this. So this is I equal one to N and the sum from T equal one to capital T and it's gonna be the same for every. Okay, and then here, capital T, Okay, of y i minus y bar i squared. And this number here is the same as this number here. It's just that, and when you go back here, what you do is 100 minus 50, 150. Right? This one minus this one, this one minus this one, and so on. The last one, the between. I want you to imagine the between actually runs the regression in averages because the between r square really doesn't care about what's going on per year. So the data set for the computation of the between R square doesn't really care about the value for 1990 and the value of 1991. It will just take one value per year, okay? Or one value per cross section. So for Argentina, it would be using its average 150, 350 and 554 Peru. So the regression itself is run in averages, okay? So, or, or it's run in means. So this one would be the sum from i equal one to n, and as I said, it's not, it doesn't care about t, so we don't have t here. y bar hat i minus y bar square over the sum from i equal one to n of y bar, because this is the actual uh, observation, like the actual observation is not just the regular y, the actual observation is the y bar, minus y bar squared, okay? And just for, uh, not to confuse you, why this y is different than the others, it's just like, okay, so the y bar, all right? And, um, so this one is the between, the one that cares more about cross-sectional, so it doesn't really care about the specifics of the time. So that's why this one, as you can see, it does not move over time. It's just getting, like the main model, I just wanna make sure that you understand this. The main model here is like this, y bar is equal to beta zero plus beta one x bar one, okay? Uh, plus u bar. And this one only moves over cross sections. So the actual regression for computing the between R square is, is a regression that was run in means. Okay, and that's why 
my dependent variable is y bar. Here, my dependent variable is the regular y, and the regular, like the one that you know. Same thing here. The main difference between this one and this one is here I'm using column five, here I'm using column four. Here again, I'm using column five, but my dependent variable is run under means. Okay? I hope that this is clear. Okay? Uh, the last thing before.